When I first became a researcher many years ago, I had no particular interest in studying intelligence, but I worked with children of all kinds and also with uh, patients who were brain damaged as a result of uh, tumors or trauma. And every day I was observing people who would be strong in one area, maybe average in a second area of cognition, and then have difficulties with a third area. And without knowing it, I was coming to the conclusion that any notion of intelligence as being a singular thing just didn't make sense. Because if you take the notion of intelligence literally, um, then if a person is smart in one thing, he or she should be smart in everything. If they're average in one thing, they should be average in everything. And it just doesn't work out that way as any teacher or indeed any parent who has more than one or two children learns. So um, I began to develop an alternative view called the theory of multiple intelligences, or MI theory for short. And the theory has become quite well known. It's also quite controversial. But the basic idea of the theory is, is quite simple. Namely, instead of intelligence being a singular thing, as it were, one computer inside our skull, we have a number of different computers in our skull. And I call those the multiple intelligences. Uh, standardized tests look at linguistic and logical intelligence, and that's fine. But there are at least half a dozen other intelligences. We call them musical intelligence, spatial intelligence, bodily kinesthetic intelligence, naturalist intelligence, interpersonal intelligence, understanding of other people, intrapersonal intelligence, understanding of yourself. Each of these computers works in a distinctive way. And the bottom line for people, whether it's about yourself or your students or your parents or your children, is somebody can be strong in one intelligence, average in a second intelligence, and not very good in a third intelligence. And that can be changed to some extent. It's not uh, written in stone, but we have different intellectual profiles. Um, so one question people often ask is, well, is there an artistic intelligence? And you know, when you hear the word music, you say, well, maybe that's a, an artistic intelligence. But actually, I don't think so. Any intelligence can be used artistically or not. So let's take language. I'm speaking with you now, and I'm using language. But I'm not being poetic. I'm not being metaphoric. I'm not calling attention to the sounds. So. I'm using linguistic intelligence in a non-artistic way, but a poet or writer could use his linguistic intelligence or her linguistic intelligence aesthetically. We well, might say, well, music, that's certainly an artistic intelligence. But I'd make this exactly the same argument there. Namely, you know, when I turn on my computer, I hear a musical sound, but it, I'm not going to dance to it. I don't listen to the quality of the sound. Similarly, if I'm at a camp and they're playing Reveille or they're playing uh, wake up at morning, it's just a signal. It has no particularly aesthetic quality. Or if the dentist puts on some sounds, God forbid, I'm just trying to avoid screaming. So music, like anything else, can be used in an artistic way, the way our great artists do, our great performers. But it can be used also just in a signaling, kind of artistically neutral way. So that's the general point about multiple intelligences. We have a number of different computers. And anybody who's an educator should think about that, because it means we can't teach everybody in the same way. People don't learn in the same way. And particularly important, when we're teaching something, we should present it in lots of different ways, because we, that way we'll reach more intelligences and more people who have um, different profiles of intelligence. So that's a general f short introduction to MI theory. I'm going to turn it over now to Ellen, Ellen Winner, who's going to talk about uh, some of the educational implications of MI theory with a particular focus on the arts. Ellen? Our schools, unlike math and reading, for example, and I think that's unfortunate, one of the ways in which arts educators and arts advocates have fought back to try to make it clear that the arts are core and central to a child's education is to make the claim that the arts improve children's test scores, primarily in reading and math. I became interested in that claim and investigated it and unfortunately found out that there is very little, if any, strong evidence for this claim. And when I published this research saying, no, the arts do not improve test scores, we need the arts for other reasons, people got very angry at me. Uh, the head of a foundation called me up and said, you should not have published this research. 
uh, you are going to single-handedly destroy quality arts education for the children in this country. Now, of course, no researcher has that kind of power, but it really did shake me up. And I said, no, 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 I'm not anti-arts, I'm pro-arts, but I'm trying to change the conversation about why we need the arts in our schools. And I decided with my colleague Lois Hetland that we would adopt a new direction in our research. And instead of uh, investigating what was wrong with the test score claim, we would go into arts classrooms and observe really carefully what was being taught and what was being learned and try to come up with a framework for the kinds of broad habits of mind or thinking dispositions that we saw being taught in the arts classroom. We started with the visual arts. One of my students is now doing this with music. We could have started with any art form, but we started with the visual arts. And so the examples that I'm going to give you are from the visual arts classroom. We came up with a framework of a number of habits of mind that we believed we saw being taught in the studio art classroom. One of these we call observe. Students are being told to look really, really carefully and notice things that they wouldn't otherwise, they wouldn't normally notice. Um, and this connects to Howard's visual spatial intelligence and it also connects to naturalist intelligence, both of which require, both of which involve close observation. A second habit of mind that we saw being instilled was what we called envision. Teachers would come around to students and say, what would happen if you changed this blue and made it green? Or what if you moved this form over here? And what that forces students to do is to envision, to imagine in their minds, generate mental imagery. And this habit of mind is, of course, connected to the visual spatial intelligence. A third broad habit of mind we called express. Teachers would come around to students and say, you know, this drawing is accurate, it's well rendered, but it's lifeless. Where's the atmosphere? Where's the mood? Where's the personal vision? Because an accurate, an accurate drawing without any expression in it is just dead. And this focus on this, this habit of mind of expression res relates very closely, I believe, to the personal intelligences that Howard writes about. Intra-intelligence, understanding yourself, and inter-intelligence, understanding other people and being able to use your artwork as a way of communicating with others. We also noticed three working styles that were being fostered in the arts classroom. One of them was engage and persist, that was the name we gave it, meaning Students were taught to stick to projects over long periods of time, and not give up. One of them was stretch and explore, m learning to take risks, to muck around, to experiment, to learn from mistakes. I'll give you an example. One day, students came into a ceramics class and the teacher said, today we're going to play around with clay and see if you can come up with a new technique for making clay stick to, e to parts of clay stick to one another. And you would not hear a math teacher start off her class by saying, today we're going to play around with numbers and see if you can come up with a new way to add. Very unlikely. So this is probably very specific to the arts. And a third uh, working style was what we called reflect. Students were being told constantly to think about what they were doing and to verbalize what they were doing, to explain their process, to explain their goals, and also to evaluate what's working, what's not, and why. Now these three working styles, engage and persist, stretch and explore and reflect um, are habits that could be used with any intelligence. You could use you could use your mathematical intelligence and you could engage and persist with projects. You could stretch and explore with math and try out new things even though teachers don't often ask you to do that in math and you could reflect upon your process and your strategies. Now I've just used examples from the visual arts but the other art forms also make clear connections to the different intelligences. Dance uses bodily kinesthetic intelligence as well as probably interpersonal to try to communicate to the audience. Music, of course, uses musical intelligence. Poetry uses linguistic intelligence. Um, so as Howard said, there's no artistic intelligence, but any intelligence can be put to artistic use. So this habit, this framework we developed of the habits of mind uh, we call this the hidden curriculum in the art classroom. It's what's really being taught. We, and we wrote a book on this called Studio Thinking, The Real Benefits of Visual Arts Education. And the Studio Habits Framework is now being widely adopted in the United States and also in other countries.
So thank you, Ellen. Um, even though Ellen and I have worked together for many years and lived together for many years, we've never actually before taken MI theory and integrated it with the studio Habits of Mind. So this was a fun opportunity for us. And just to, just to summarize briefly, um, MI theory is a theory of how the mind is organized. And it basically claims that we have a number of different computers or analytic devices. And any one of them can be used artistically or not. Um, there's no intelligence which is only dedicated to the arts. But every intelligence can be used in ways that help us to express important ideas, important concepts, important emotions. And what Ellen has done is to talk about the real benefits of education in the arts, not the arts as being a way of improving something else, but actually learning um, how to think better um, in the media which the arts uniquely present. And the particular um, icing on the cake today has been to talk about how each of these habits of mind relates to one or more of the intelligence which, is, which I've developed. So I hope that whoever is um, watching this little video um, can um, think new and perhaps in a better way about the kind of learning they do and the kind of learning their students do and the kind of experience you have when you go to a concert or play a piece of music or go to the theater or read some poetry or even better, write some. Thank you.